Good morning. I'd like to welcome those watching remotely. We have 39 devices tuning in right now from uh, Texas, Iowa. We have uh, someone in Norway. And so uh, to you in Nor tell the Norwegians hi for us. I'm not sure who's in Norway, but we're glad you're with us this morning. Uh, worshiping together, we've been working on our monthly memory verse from Psalm 9, verse 1. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all your wonderful deeds. All right. Today, uh, we're talking about pure living. And today's lesson on this topic is about... Um, what is my attitude about pure living? And so, um, what's my attitude about being holy? Do I feel like I am holy? Do you feel like you are holy? Do you live holy? One of our struggles with this is um, kind of a struggle of just, I can't, I can't do it. That's a common struggle we have on the topic of God's holiness or His purity. Our grandson, Noah, he's three, and we, uh, Stephanie got him a, a train set, and uh, so it has all these, uh, the track pieces are wood, made out of wood, and they have two grooves in them, so that's where the little, little train pieces, their wheels roll in these little grooves, and um, so we set that up, we play with that, and uh, lots, it has lots of pieces, lots of different track-shaped pieces, and so I'll be trying to, you know, this one's not, no, this one's curved too much. I'll be trying to get another one. He taught me something the other day. <laughs> he, he showed me, he flipped it over. Would you believe that thing has grooves on the backside too? You could just flip it. I've, you know, I got one turning this way. I need to go the other way. No, where's where? Anyway, you can learn something from a three-year-old. But um, invariably, there are a couple pieces that are, uh, they go up to the bridge. And so their shape, most of them are flat, but there are a couple that go up. And so he tries to put them together, not realizing. Now, they go together like a jigsaw puzzle. One At the end of each piece, one has a, a small rounded piece, and the other has a small opening that that rounded piece would go in. And so, uh, But he'll get that, those pieces that are curved upwards and try to put that like it's a flat piece. It won't go. And he will try, and he will try, and then he will be frustrated can't do it. I can't, and, and, and it breaks him to have to turn, turn to me and act. You know, he wants to do it. So to have to, uh, to say, help, I can't do this, that's something spiritually we never grow out of, do we? I can't, I cannot do holy by myself. I can't do it. Well, Hebrews, I want to look at a few passage on passages on uh, passages. That, that kind of hit some uh, similar important ideas. Verse 14, Hebrews 4.14. 4, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold to, the con let us hold to our confession. And we'll have that idea holding to our confession. That idea we'll see um, two or three times. And what that is about is stay faithful. Sadly, of us here, of the number that's here, in two years, more than, more than a handful won't be here. Might not be anywhere. I, I've been in ministry long enough to see that the devil drags Christians away one at a time, one at a time, one at a time. He's pulling at all of us. He wants to drag you away because you give up. He wants to drag you away because you're mad. He wants to drag you away because you're ashamed, because you're hurt, I I any number of reasons. But that's what hold fast is about. Stay with it. And then verse 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Jesus understands. We pray and we close each prayer in Jesus' name. Now, you don't have to do it at the end of the prayer. Uh, but somehow, some way, we pray to the Father. We go through Jesus. He's our high priest. He understands. He, he lived in this body. He wanted to sin. He understands temptation. So it says, one who in every, every respect has been tempted as we are, yet 
was without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. Now that's in prayer. When you go to God in prayer, Scripture says as a Christian, if you're a Christian, you go with confidence. It's like sometimes uh, after services, I give candy out. I give it to the children primarily who do the outline on the back of the bulletin as motivation. Um, But I'm also real, real um, soft and real free with my candy given out. But anyway, I have candy, and so sometimes I forget the bucket, and I'll send one of our kids in there to get it. They'll go into my office. They go in there kind of like this. You know, I'm not even sure I'm really supposed to be in here, although he's told me to go in here. But if you watch Abby or any of our, 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 my daughters through the years go into my office, they go in like they own the place. Now, I, I, what I really am trying to point out there is they are very comfortable in that space. That's their dad's office. That's their dad's place. They are the daughter of the one who this place belongs to. And that's how we are to approach God, not with arrogance, not flippant, but very comfortable. You go to God in prayer with confidence, draw near to him that we may receive mercy. Look, look, look what we're going to get. Mercy and find grace. Grace is unmerited favor. It's God being favorable to us when we don't deserve it. Unmerited favor to help in time of need. So this first, this first problem we're addressing is, I can't do it. Well, God says, come to me. I'll help you. I'll help you. Sometimes you need help with temptation. God, I can't do it alone. God knows that. I'll help you. Sometimes you need help because you failed. God says, I understand. Come, confess. Grace, mercy, come to me. We need God. All right, let's run down to, uh, if you you go to Hebrews chapter 10, just a few chapters later, we have a similar idea that the writer covers again. He says, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Do Do you hear that confidence? with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. That's forgiveness. And our bodies washed with pure water. That would reference baptism. This is a, we're in a saved place. We have forgiveness. Let us hold fast to the confession. Now there's that idea again, don't give up. For he who promised is faithful. So it says, let us hold fast without wavering. He who promised is faithful. God's not going to be unfaithful. We are going to fall short. God's not going to fall short. God will never fail you. And so when we struggle, it's, it's, we are the ones that uh, the, the flesh is weak. But we're to draw near to God. That's where we find purity. If you say, if I say, are you holy? Well, that's hard for you to answer. If you ask me, Elliot, are you holy? Well, not just me, No. But with God's help and through the blood of Jesus and God's grace, yes. Yes. Then verse 24, let us consider how to stir up one another. So this is whole, let's, let us stay faithful. We need, it's so important. We need each other to help us. Stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together. And we get that here. Um, small groups this afternoon, this evening, small groups will meet. That's more encouraging one another. All the more as you see the day of drawing near for, excuse me, let me stop there. All the more as you say the, see the day drawing near. So we have three ideas here. Stir up one another, encourage one another, um, and, and sandwiched in between that is don't quit meeting together. Hold firm, hold fast, stay faithful. Verse 26, for if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. There's no grace there. So you have to have God's grace to be righteous. You have to have God's grace to be holy. You, you, that comes through Jesus' blood. And that's through God and Jesus' blood and entrance into the kingdom through baptism If we abuse that, there's no grace out there. If we just live our way, 
All we have is a fearful expectation of judgment. All right, let's go to another one. Romans 5.17 says, For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign through the one man, Jesus Christ. So this is comparing Adam Adam sinned, and then we followed in suit. And through Adam, it's saying, you know, one man and then all. But then it says through Jesus. Jesus is one man. Look at what happened through Jesus. We receive the abundance of grace, unmerited favor, through Jesus. And the free gift of righteousness. So if I ask, are you righteous? Are you a righteous person? Well, that's kind of hard to answer. You know, just me? No. Because I fall short. But through Jesus, through God's grace, through the free gift, God is the one that makes you righteous. God's the one that makes me righteous. Jesus' blood makes me righteous. And our righteousness can reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore... As one trespass led to condemnation for men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. That's Jesus on the cross. In verse 19, For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. That's God's grace. That's purity. Through Jesus you are righteous. If you're in Christ, through Jesus, I am righteous and pure, and I have peace in my spirit. Do you feel at peace with God? Because that's why Jesus came. And if God's children, if Christians don't feel at peace with God, we're missing. We're missing out. Because Jesus paid the price. The gift of righteousness is there. God wants us to live in that. Look at verse, uh, let's read on incidentally. So in the next chapter, of course, in the original letter, there's no, there were no chapter breaks. This would have ran together. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So it's a reminder God's grace is there for us, but not to be abused. In fact, when we were baptized, baptism does two things. It washes away sins. It also buries something. Baptism is a funeral. We bury our old self. And Paul reminds them, he says, you can be righteous and have peace with God and be in God's grace. But remember, you buried that old life. Don't go back to it. And so we don't live in sin, we live in God's grace. But we still feel like my little grandson, sometimes I just, I keep falling short. And if you're trying to uh, live right and you keep falling short and it bothers you, you're doing it right, by the way. You're doing it right. It's when it doesn't bother you anymore that there's a problem. But look at first, I want, I want to read this passage again from 1 John 1, 7. I want to read it from the New Century. New Century version, I like it because it's very, it's written on probably a, maybe a fifth grade level. Fifth, sixth maybe. Um, it's not as technically accurate as ESV, New American Standard, but I like it sometimes because the message is made so simple. Sometimes uh, uh, a point that Scripture is making comes through better. It says, if we live in the light, as God is in the light, we can share fellowship with each other. Then the blood of Jesus, God's Son, cleanses us from every sin. From every sin. The word in the Greek that's translated cleanses is in a tense that is ongoing. It's in a grammatical tense. Uh, it's ongoing. And in the English, it kind of, that, that is also true, but even more so in the Greek. 
some of y'all play games on your phones. If you play games on your phones ever, raise your hand. Let me just see kind of who, who we're talking, who I'm talking to here. Okay. So um, I'm not really, I don't, I'm not really uh, historically into that. Uh, for whatever reason, I get bored quickly. But I found a game recently, and it's a, 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 it's a game about tanks, like uh, military tanks, battling each other. So all your opponents, they're, they're in a tank. Everybody's in a tank. It's just a tank battle, okay? Um, and different people are playing from wherever, all over the world. I don't know any of them, uh, and I'm not doing it socially. But anyway, it's a fun game. Whoever designed it, it's, it, it, it's pretty fun. And so there are different aspects to it and, and different uh, kind of powers or abilities that you can have for a limited time. And one of those abilities, uh, features, if you have it, is it will, because you're, you have a bar that tells you your health. And so when you get hit from an opponent, your health, it goes down. It depends on how, how good their tank is. Uh, and it, it will go down and down multiple shots that you receive until at the bottom, then you die. You have to wait a little bit, and then you play again. And so uh, one feature, if you have this is uh, a health, it replenishes your health. And so, uh, and it actually throws out a ring, a circle, to where your teammates can come inside this ring. And for 60 seconds, whatever shots you, whatever damage you receive, it replenishes it automatically. That's what John is saying here. If you're in the light, if you're in the ring, if you're with God, then the blood of Jesus cleanses us from every sin. Then he goes on to kind of clarify what that means and what it doesn't. Verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we're fooling ourselves. So don't think, don't think that you're above falling short. But if we confess our sins... So we still have to, we're still trying to avoid sin and we still feel bad when we fall short. If we confess our sins, he will forgive us. He will forgive our sins because we can trust God to do what is right. He will cleanse us from all the wrongs we have done. This describes God's grace. His grace to make us righteous. And if you're doing this, you are righteous, you are pure, and by God's grace, you have purity. Isn't that a wonderful thing? God's trying to show us how we can be clean spiritually, and it's only through God can we do that. All right, I want to uh, kind of speak to another struggle. So one of our struggles is we feel like we can't do it. Another struggle we have is, well, because this is about our attitude toward purity. Another struggle is, well, just how pure do I want to live? Just how holy do, do I want to be? And Psalm 119, verse 9 says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wonder from your commandments. So we know Satan is the father of lies. God is the author of what's right. But the question is, do we resent God? For calling us to a holy life. Do you, do you ever, do we, do we sometimes do the right thing but with a bad attitude? Or sometimes do we not try really that hard because, you know, I want to do it my way. Do I trust God that moral purity is best? Just how pure do I want to be in my words, for example? With gossip. Just how pure do I want to be? Uh, or with foul language, how pure do I want to be in my language? Or in my anger, how, do, how I act when I get angry, how pure do I want to be? Or in my dress with modesty, or with my eyes and what I look at, how pure do I want to be? Or with my heart, forgiving other people, or envy, or bitterness, how pure do I want to be? I want to share with you three uh, scriptures from Psalm 119. Now, this psalm is a, a wonderful psalm in your Bible. It's the longest chapter in Scripture. 
the entire psalm speaks about the Bible, but it speaks about it in many different ways. God's rules, his statutes, his commands, what God tells us, the psalmist loves it in love. It's like a, you know what a love letter sounds like if, if a, a man or a woman is in love and they just write about their, you know, their beloved and the Song of Solomon does that and, you know, I, ju- I just love them so much for all these reasons. That's what this chapter is about, but it's about God's commands for us. So verse 7, I'll just share three of them with you. Verse 7, I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. He celebrates God's rules. And then verse 67, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and you do good. Teach me your statutes. I dare to say that older Christians here, some of the things that older Christians here aren't tempted by as much or maybe they don't do as much, it's because they learned the hard way. I already tried that. God was right. God was right. So older Christians are not without spiritual scars from doing what what the psalmist says. He says, I was afflicted. I went astray. Went astray, then was afflicted. Then I learned, then I come back, God, you were right, you're good, teach me, teach me. And then verse 80 says, may my heart be blameless in your statutes, that I may not be put to shame. I I love the desire in this psalm to be pure. It's a love, and you can be in love for God's rules. His rules are right. His instructions are right, and they're never intended to limit us from anything that's good. And so I want to talk uh, a little bit about, I want to talk to the guys primarily, primarily to the guys and then to the ladies. Um, I want to talk about lust and modesty, and uh, this is uncomfortable, so we're just going to get uncomfortable together. We're just all going to get uncomfortable and, and let God speak to us. It's not an easy topic, and especially in our current day and in our current culture, because our society says, don't tell me anything. But God loves us, and he's trying to teach us. And so let me start with guys, males. This is uh, Lust is is more an issue or a struggle with males, more so. Okay, so not entirely. Um, It is something that almost all males struggle with or have struggled with. And it's not something, guys, it's not something that we are powerless over. It's not something you are powerless over, although you will need God's help. To be pure in your mind and with your eyes regarding lust and and impure thoughts, you will need God's help. You absolutely will, but you're not powerless. So 1 Corinthians 10, 13, a great passage on temptation, says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. There's always a way out. We, guys, we can never blame ladies or the computer or whatever it is that, that put something before us that was temp- tempting to our eyes and our mind. We can never blame it on them and say, well, the, you know, they're just, I mean, I couldn't help it if, if, they, if they wouldn't dress this way or act this way or those type things. In fact, God gave every man a neck and two eyelids. And he expects us to use them. And I was fortunate as a young man growing up, I remember dad, we would watch things on television and something would come up and it, and it was immodest uh, sexually and dad would say, turn your head. Turn your head. I had a neck. And I had a godly father to show me how to use it. And I thank God I, I did. Now, that's not common. 
But Jesus spoke to this, and he said in Matthew 5, 29, If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out. Throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. The message on, on lust for, for guys is we need to get serious about it. To struggle with this temptation is common. Uh, men, by the way, tend to battle this alone, which makes it easier for Satan but we need to get far, farther and farther from temptation, whatever it is. We need to get farther from it. Um, and we need God's strength to do it. You're going to need the Spirit. You're going to need, you're going to need all three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, but it's something we have to, Jesus reminds us, get very, very serious about it. Okay? Very serious. I want to encourage the men on that, and I ask that you pray for them. We live in a very sexualized world. So, uh, ladies with modesty, which is more so uh, a challenge for ladies than it is men, I just want to point out a few things and share a scripture. One is, your beauty was given you by God. God made Eve, and he said it's good. Now, I have no doubt Eve was beautiful. She was beautiful. Adam probably looked like, you know, was Adam beautiful? I don't think so. God made men and women differently, and he made women beautiful. And ladies, you have uh, beauty that is wholesome and appropriate and an aspect uh, for everyone, and then you have a type of beauty that is more personal, it's more sensual, and it's more sexual to males. And... I know I, I sympathize with our ladies because you are attractive, you want to be attractive, you want to dress attractive. And that, that's, that's how God made you. And that's a good thing. But oftentimes, uh, females, you, you may see your attractive out, outfits. To you, it's attractive, but to males, it's sexual. And so one point, I want to make kind of two clear points if I can. Ladies, your bodies are more attractive than you realize. They are more, your bodies are more attractive than you realize. And to most males, short shorts or skirts or cleavage or showing a midriff to males is sexual. Uh, you just need to know that's how the male population is triggered or views that. Now, so ladies have a, a sexual beauty that's very attractive, but we know God is the giver and the creator of sex, and that part of a woman was made for the privacy of her marriage. We all agree on public parts, private parts, and the challenge is where to draw the line. So, um, what does purity have to do with this? I want to make my second point, if I can make it clearly. Modest dress is not about, well, men are just kind of pervs, and so ladies, you're just going to need to cover up. That is not it. That is not it. Another way of saying that is, girls, you're just going to have to sacrifice because guys can't control themselves. That's not it. God expects men to take care of their, themselves and to walk holy. So men have responsibilities. I've covered that. A neck and two eyelids. So ladies, your dress, if I could encourage you with one message, it would be dress for yourself to feel good about yourself and dress to honor God and don't dress to be attractive sexually to men or to guys, okay? And so it's a, it's a, a beautiful thing. The only, the, our, our question on this whole topic, which is super uncomfortable, is just, okay, well, where's the line and, and, and why? And so, but purity in, in clothing is a blessing because it doesn't send mixed messages. And men get, or males get the wrong message. And I'm not saying 
that, uh, that events to follow are shame on the female. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying, ladies, God protects and purity protects and God is trying to guide you in a good way. And so purity and clothing, um, it does not tempt someone to sin. And that's a good thing. When by your dress you don't tempt someone to do wrong, that's a good thing. It's absolutely a good thing. And so um, our scripture on this, 1 Corinthians six nineteen, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Now that's written to all of us. And it's written really about sexual immorality. But on the topic, I know it's hard. I know it's hard, ladies, for anyone to try to tell you how to dress. And I'm not trying to tell you how to dress. I'm trying to ask you to let God tell you how to dress. Honor God. Honor God. God will not steer you wrong. Honor God. I want to close with uh, one more verse from Psalm 119. Uh, verses 60, 164 and 165. This was our scripture reading. Seven times a day I praise you for your righteous rules. Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. I want to encourage you to l- fall in love with God's law. Fall in love with his instructions for us. And we have a song to encourage us this morning. Uh, let God have his way with you. So during this song, if you have something on your heart that we could help you with, we could lift up to God and pray for you. Uh, Or if you're here and you've never given your life to Christ, never had that funeral, never died to your old self, let us help you with that. If you'd come while we stand and sing. Would you live for Jesus and be always pure and good? Would you walk with him within the narrow road? Would you have him carry all your load? Let him have his way with me. His power can make you what you